have uh, I've been preparing our musical community for the book of Amos. Uh, we began to read it a couple of weeks ago, and we read through it. It was like, wow, this is going to be exciting. <laughs> I had somebody come in just this morning. He said, I read the first two chapters. I don't know what you're going to preach on for 11 weeks. <laughs> so we'll just sit down and buckle up. How many of you grew up with Chicken Finger Friday? Huh? Chicken Finger Friday? Okay. Uh, for some of you, it may have been another deal. But everybody with me, right? Families have these eating rhythms. For some of you, it may be Cheese Pizza Monday. Taco Tuesday. You got me here, man. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with this. I love the fact that we have these eating habits, these, these favorite meals. You know, we have crock pot Mondays, crock pot Tuesdays, crock pot Wednesdays. <laughs> and leftover crock pot Fridays. <laughs> I have a feeling that we will not be having crock pot Monday tomorrow. <laughs> We'll be having peanut butter and jelly. <laughs> I love it. I love it. All of you understand, right? You get it. You know these rhythms that you have. And I think. I think that. Um, I think it's good. I think these are. It's good to have favorite meals. Uh, but I was talking to a few weeks ago about uh, to a woman who said that her children was going to the doctor uh, because uh, he had a vitamin deficiency. And then we began to talk, and I began to go, man, I'm sorry to hear about that. And then I said, so, so what does he eat? Well, he eats pizza. <laughs> like, what else does he eat? No, that's all, that's all he eats, just pizza. I get him pizza on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday, and I was like, better be glad all he has is a vitamin deficiency. Right? <laughs> Bless his heart. <laughs> Listen, I'm not judging, but I do know, I do know this, that if we expect to have a healthy diet, a balanced diet is important. I know some of you are going, okay, where are you going? <laughs> well, in our faith family, we have primarily spent most of this year in the New Testament. We spent most of this year in the New Testament, and a vast majority of our teaching in the New Testament is not wrong, it's not bad, but we believe it's helpful that at least once a year that we go into the Old Testament in order to have a good, balanced diet of the Bible. <coughs> Last year, if y'all remember around this time, I think we went through Haggai. Haggai, and this year we're going to go through Amos. Uh, for many of you, this whole series is going to be like asking your children to sit, sit down and eat broccoli. Right? And, uh, or the turnip greens. Right? Turnip greens. And what is it that you tell them? You don't know if you like it until you try it. So I'm going to ask that, okay? You don't know if you're going to like it until you try it, so don't judge just just because the same is here, okay? For many of you, the book, this study is going to be like this. Uh, please at least, like I tell my children when they're at somebody's home and they offer them something to eat, you are required to take a thank you bite. A bite to just show that you're, you're great gratitude for that. Um, but while you're taking a thank you bite, I'm going to be feasting because I love the turnip greens. Alright, you hear me? And it's amazing how when you begin to eat these things, or that's the only thing you have to eat, it's amazing how quick your taste buds change. I can tell you this, when I was younger, my mother is here this morning, um, and she can testify to this, I really didn't like this kind of food, but I have grown now, and the older I get, the more I begin to like this type of food. And I think that's the way it is, I think that's the way it's going to be with this study also. The more you're in it, the more you're going to enjoy it. Paul said in Romans 15, 4, he said this, Whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction, so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. As a pastor, I am challenged here in, first two, first, uh, in two ways. First, I want to make the book of Amos currently relevant for our current day. Some of you may be asking, why are we going to study a prophet that was thousands and thousands of years ago, and what relevancy does that have with us today? That is the challenge of any pastor, right? To come up, to preach the gospel message, to be faithful to the exegesis of that scripture, but also 
Um, I, all, I remember what John Stott said, a great preacher. He once said, you need to have the Bible in one hand, and you need to have the newspaper in the other. To stay rooted in the scriptures as the entire and fellow one every word of truth, but to see how that is being played out in every day. And I hope that I can do that and, and, and hope to make it relevant to our day in this whole series. Second, I want to give us hope. And the reason for the second is because the book of Amos is chillingly devastating. Chillingly <coughs> devastating. Many of the Old Testament prophecies have embedded in them a hope. Hosea, the Lord loves Israel despite her sin. I was reading uh, some summaries of a commentator, and he was writing a, a comment, uh, and he, he wrote a summary of each book. And when he wrote this, he said, Hosea, the summary for that is, the Lord loves Israel despite her sin. Now that's hopeful, right? That's encouraging. What about Joel? Joel, judgment precedes Israel's future spiritual revival. So there's, there's this hope of, hey, judgment is coming, but there's this hope of a future spiritual revival. What about Jonah? Uh, he said, divine grace is universal. Well, there's some hope, right? Divine grace is universal. But then he says, Amos, God is just and must judge sin. Ah, right? Sounds just great. Some of you are like, when this is the Sunday I decided to come to my summit? <laughs> I can promise you this, the Faith Family will testify to this. I planned this sermon series almost 12 months ago, not knowing what was going to happen in the meantime. So this morning we're going to look at our series called Roar, and you will see why we named it that as we begin to proceed through this series. Um, and we will begin in verses, in chapter 1 of Amos, verses 1 through 2. Verses 1 through 3, the lion roars, and this morning we're going to see him speak. Uh, if you have a Bible, if you don't have your Bibles, I want you to look under the seat in front of you. There should be some red Bibles, and Amos should be around page 482 in those Bibles. Around page 482. And uh, I hope that you have your own scriptures and that you uh, will follow along with us as we begin to read this morning. Book of Amos, chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. This is the word of the Lord. May it encourage us, instruct us this morning. The words of Amos, who was among the sheep herders from Tekoa, which he envisioned in visions concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, son of Joash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. He said, The Lord roars from Zion, and from Jerusalem he utters his voice. And the shepherd's pasture grounds mourn, and the summit of Carmel dries up. So it's great. Father, we come to you under the awesome authority of the Word of God being written for us, knowing that whatever is written in our past is for our encouragement and for our perseverance in the present. So God, I pray that as we even begin to study this Word that you would be with your servant this morning, and may I preach it and be faithful to it. And I pray, Father, through all of the series of this message, such a message of judgment, chilling rebuke to people, that God, we would begin to see the beauty of the cross and what it means for us. God, we would lift your name on high, and we would even come into this place this very morning, not maybe even knowing what the name of Jesus meant, but when we leave, we might even be able to say what a beautiful name it is for all that you've done for us. So as we equip your people here today, Father, Pray that your spirit would meet us and do the work that you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This morning I want you to know that God has been gracious to us by giving us four words to follow along. Now for those of you who have been a part of our faith family, you know usually, sometimes, I'm not able to get four words that start with the same letter. God has been good to us. Four words. The person, the place, the people, and the prophecy. 
person, the place, the people, and the prophecy. First, the person. The letter starts the words of Amos, who was among the sheep herders from Tekoa. Amos was the first of the four 8th century prophets. Now, when the Bible was put together, you have to understand that it was not put in a necessarily a chronological order. As a matter of fact, the last historical book in the Bible is uh, Nehemiah. You have Ezra and Nehemiah, which, by the way, in the Jewish Bible, is one book. It was one book put together. Nehemiah is the last of history. So when you're reading through the Bible, history stops there. And then every book after Nehemiah that has been written, you take and you place back into that history. And that's what we're going to attempt to do a little bit this morning. Uh, and then when you begin to hear about the major prophets and the minor prophets, y'all know that's what we call them. It's not major because they're better, it's major because they're bigger. That's simply that easy, all right? So don't let that complicate you. So there were four 8th century uh, prophets. So when you begin to read this, who was the earliest of those prophets? And that would be the prophet Amos. So Amos is coming to the very early in this. The other three, by the way, are Hosea who along with Amos has been called to prophesy to Israel, and then the other two are Isaiah and Micah. So if you wanted to find out what who the 8th century prophets were, there they are. you got Amos and Hosea, who were called to preach to Israel, and then you got Isaiah and Micah, who were both called to prophesy to Judah. And what we discover is, Amos is not unlike many of us in this room. I love this. This is a great encouragement to me. What does the Bible call him? A sheep herder. A sheep herder. Nothing overly special about that, right? As a matter of fact, many of you are fairly unimpressed by Amos, and that's what makes it you. However, there is a passage of Scripture um, that, that helps us see a little bit more about this normal man. Turn with me to Amos chapter 7. Amos chapter 7, I'm not going to preach through this passage, but it gives us a little bit more about him. We're going to turn to verse 14. 14. It says here, um, Amos replied to Amaziah. We'll go through this in the weeks to come. You'll see it. But this is what Amos says. I am not a prophet, nor I am the son of a prophet. In other words, he's saying, I'm not one of your professional profiteers. He says, for I am a herdsman, we know that, and a grower of sycamore figs. As my father-in-law likes to call him, the big picker. So here we have. He's a sheep herder and an arborist, right? The big picker. So there you have it. How many of y'all are impressed yet with Amos? I can. Uh, Amos, Amos, could you please tell me what you did for a living that would cause us to listen to you? Amos, I can hear the people in Bethel saying, Amos, can you tell us why we ought to listen to you? Well, I'm a sheep herder and a big pig. <laughs> right? I'm sorry. I'm sorry, you're, you're what? I'm a sheep herder and a big pig. <laughs> I can imagine him trying to get a job in the modern day church. I can imagine him trying to come up and to speak to the modern day church. First, he would, he would have never made it through the, 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 the scrutiny of trying to get a job in today's ministry. He would have never met, made it through the scrutiny of requirements that we have presented. Uh, okay, resumes, okay, hey guys, hey guys. We have his resume. Where's his, where's his master's degree in divinity? No, he has no previous prophetic experience. Uh, put, him, put him on the bottom of the pile. Put him on the bottom of the pile. I am very familiar with being on the bottom of the pastoral pile, by the way. That's exactly the story that happened to me. Got my, apparently they got my resume here. I didn't send it to them. They got my resume, and, uh, and they, they looked me over, and they were like, hmm, no seminary? No previous pastoral experience, we'll just put him on the bottom of the pile, right? And, and this is what happens to Amos here. And then, and then what happens? All the other people fall through, and in some sort of last resort, they pull him out and they go, okay, guys, this is all we got. 
Let's pull it out and let's take a look. Now you can see all the, you can see the personnel team, right? All sitting around this, this table. All of them have a copy of his, of his, of his experience. Let's see here, date of birth, 8th century, okay. He's alive, that's good. Adam, Jacoba. Oh, Jacoba. Anybody know where Jacoba is? No? Okay. 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 Experience, experience, experience. Okay, here we go, here we go, experience. You listen to Dan? Experience. This is it. He's a sheep herder and a fig picker. <laughs> hey, that's, this guy's a sheep herder and a fig picker. He's, he wants a job. He wants to preach to us. He's a sheep herder and a fig picker. Called by God to go to Israel to prophesy a really difficult message. And for the record, 
It isn't Judah looking around going, uh, asking, where do I want to go? Huh, I wonder where I want to go. I want to go. No, it's Judah going, God has called me to go here. And I think that can be a better question for our missional communities as we begin to live Christ, live out our lives. Many of you, your jobs are, de are dependent upon, uh, when I begin to speak to people in this way, they get kind of weirded out with me. They're going, what are you talking about? They begin to say, hey, um, I don't know where I want to go to work. Who, who have to, are you redeemed? Are you, are you a child of God? Yes, well, you begin to ask God to reveal that to you, and you begin to discover what he's revealed to you. Hey, listen to me, church. It's not about us going where we want to go. It's about us going where God has providentially taken us and placed us in. And it's not always safe. It's not always secure. It's not always pillow covered. Sometimes God calls us to speak to stubborn people. I got to talk to one every morning. When I look in the mirror, I got to preach the gospel to him over and over and over and over and over. <coughs> There's the Greek person, the place, the people, and now the prophecy. Verse 2. His message is straightforward. He isn't some coward looking for the approval of people, but he isn't a bully trying to manipulate them into what he wants them to do. He simply says, The Lord roars from Zion and from Jerusalem. His, uh, he utters his voice. <laughs> In other words, the Lion of Judah is speaking. And its message is going to be devastating. That's what the next passage means. The shepherds pass the grounds born and the summit of Carmel drives up. This message is going to be devastating because judgment is coming. And the reason judgment is coming is because of your disobedience. Now listen to me because we're going to go through this for 11 weeks. you got to stick with me, okay? He is, church, this is what we can't do. Do not look at this and say he's speaking to those people. He is speaking to his people. His covenant people. Listen, the judgment of God starts in the house of God. Do you hear me? It begins with his people. So I'm talking not to those people. I'm talking to us. God says, my judgment is coming because of your disobedience. And I want to say this because this is what we're going to deal with over the next few weeks, few months really. God's patience is greater than ours will ever be. His wisdom is incomprehensible. <clears throat> but I love what one preacher says. He says, but God is no moral jellyfish. It's not a patience of a moral invertebrate. His patience is not infinite. God can come to the end of his patience. He can be provoked once too often. And what has happened here? God's patience has run out against his people. God who is as equally wrapped as he is mercy, who is equally loving as he is just, has now come to that dreadful place when the most merciful thing you can do to a people is to not display your mercy. God has been waiting and waiting and trying Trying, and now God says, I'm done. I'm coming for you. Every last one of you. Do I have your attention? So here we are. A gathering of sheep herders and victors. We start by understanding wherever God has called us to serve, may we serve in that capacity as a, as a means of glorifying Him, 
honoring God's work as a, uh, as a blessing in His creation. And while we do this, we must understand that God does call people out for the purpose of proclaiming, Thus saith the Lord. We need men and women who have been broken by God to speak in the midst of their careers. But we need men who God has duly appointed to go and preach His gospel. To those whom God calls, God will place. The time, the place, the calling, they're all God's appointing. But here's the humor. We often want to, and I would say we, because I'm one of them, we often want to go where the nice people are. I was just having this conversation with a pastor's wife just the other day. I was talking to her about our calling to find something. And then she said, well, this is what we're looking for. <coughs> I was like, whoa. And I'm reading through Amos. <laughs> Bro. Of course, I was merciful. Yeah. I think in the conversation went like this. I said, I, you know, I agree. I, I, I hear you. I know your heart. I just think you and your husband need to pray about where God wants you to be. And wherever that is, may he send you. Often people leave, people leave a faith family looking for someone to tell them what they want to hear, see what they want to see, do what they want to do. Well, you know what God is saying? You need someone to preach to you what you need to hear, not what you want to hear. And I, I would love to be that guy. I would love for Rick and Nick and myself to be the men that pastor this church in the way in which God has called us to. Because when he calls men out, he tells us that we are to preach God's word for the purpose of his ministry, for the equipping of the saints, so that now you can go out and be equipped to do the work that he's called you to, and for us to pray. Those are the two offices of the pastor, to preach and to pray. Some people get that mixed up. They go, but you're a shepherd, you know, the word for shepherd. By the way, the only time that that word is ever used for pastor and shepherd is in Ephesians. Now, I'm going to take you there later if you want to go. But how are we to shepherd the church? How are we to lead the church? It is not to be at every event, everything, every day, every time. It's not to be at your beck and call. What is the purpose of the pastoral ministry of the church? Why does God call me into this ministry? He calls us for this. So that we can preach and pray. And when you call us out of those things, you're calling us to do something outside of what he's called us to do. We're called to preach and pray. And that's what we're going to do. I'm scared to say what I'm about to say. Because Friday was just a demonstration of how God works. My brother Doug, he said, I want to die serpent. He died serpent. I don't know how I want to die. But I know I'm probably going to die. The day I die, we preach this message. You hear me? Yeah. The day I die. God. <coughs> we come this morning not merely as onlookers of a historical story, but as the people of God today who have been redeemed by His grace. The God in Amos' day, they were comfortable in their surroundings. They lived in the past and they built their lives around the memories that they had. They, the people are saying, look, we're the people of God. We've done everything right. We're on time for all the religious festivals, especially the Sabbath. And give, oh, do we give. Man, you should see all the check marks we have. And by the way, we are extremely blessed. I mean, look at my clothes. This isn't this neat? But it was all a sham. It was all hypocrisy. <coughs> And he sends Amos to remind them that your past successes are useless. Because I've called you to live today. We will see this. God actually says this. God says this. I am tired of your traditions and your same old, same old. He says, I don't want to hear. He literally tells the people. Could you imagine God telling us this? I don't want to hear from you again. I don't want to hear from you again. Stop. I don't want to hear from you again. And 
until I hear from you and the expression is a true expression of your heart. The very reality <coughs> that religiosity is repulsive to God. If our profession isn't accompanied by the evidence of this religion, the people of God then are not like unlike the people of God today. And so this Amos comes and says, we better take a long, hard look at ourselves. We better be a people of repentance and faith. Repenting for our hearts to come to be like Jesus and faith in the fact that he will work that out in us and through us. Because church, if you ever come to the point of thinking that you're going to be able to come into this place on Sunday and put on your faith mask and your sham and then walk out of here and not have another thing to do with God for the rest of your week. I want to call you to repentance this very moment. And I want you to know this. There will come a day where God will say, I'm done. I'm done. The name is shared this from God. I bet he was as loved and appreciated as I am now. <laughs> Man, doesn't that just make you feel good? Don't you just feel like going out and, I don't know, reading a book? Having your best life now. <laughs> no, they hated every bit of it. God's people look for those who say what they want to hear instead of what they need to hear. We live in a day when we have bought more into psychology than theology. We have reduced biblical obligation to personal options. We have become preoccupied with church growth as we lost sight of the God who makes the church grow. Yes. We have grown strong on politics, but weak on prayer. Yes. And unless we recover the truth from God's word and bring our lifestyles in the line with what our lips proclaim, find some and hear the words of Amos this season and let it come as a stern warning. Because there is nowhere in the Bible that says that any congregation will last forever. The church, nothing can stand against God's church. Nothing. But just because we congregate won't make us the church. Come on now. For it is time for judgment to begin in the family of God. Those of you who are here without a relationship to God, you're saying, wow, you're really talking me into this. <clears throat> oh, my brother and sister, if I could talk you into it, I would try. See, I can't talk you into salvation. The only thing I've been called to do is to preach the word. But I want you to, to listen to what I'm about to say because some of you are going, where is grace? Donnie, where is grace? Can I tell you where grace is? It's on the cross called Calvary. That's where grace is. <clears throat> you see, God comes to his people because he has given them time and time and time. You're going to see it. He's given them time and time, chance of chance of chance of chance of chance to repent and believe, to repent. Come to me, come to me, I'm calling you. Uh, in the, the word that he uses, you'll see this in this, in this book, it'll say, for three transgressions and for four. You're going to see this time and time again. He calls them over and over and over and over. Uh, can I speak to you real quick? Now parents, I'm not judging. But do you ever, do you ever see parents in Target? And they go, that's one. <laughs> that's two. 
two. Don't make me get to three. If, if you make me get, you better stop that. Don't let me. It's like they never get to three. <laughs> Thank you. 